All right, we're looking at William Blake today and his uh, two of his works, um, though we're going to focus on one in particular, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. Uh, we'll also come to his uh, prophetic work, uh, Milton, uh, towards the end, but we're not going to get into that in detail simply because we won't have the time to do so. I'll, I'll deal largely with its famous introduction, which has been made into a uh, famous English uh, him called Jerusalem. Uh, but let me say a little bit about Mr. Blake. Uh, Blake is actually, we're dealing with matters on the course a little bit anachronistically here because Blake is actually the eldest of the romantic writers that we will be looking at, born in uh, 1757, the same year in which uh, Edmund Burke penned the uh, philosophical inquiry into the origins of the sublime and beautiful. Uh, Blake is, uh, unlike Wordsworth uh, and most of the Romantic poets, uh, born in London. Uh, Keats was as well. Um, he's the second son of a well-to-do hosier, um, and he was a rather precocious and unusual child, prone to uh, visionary uh, episodes. Uh, apparently, while he was a child, he says that he saw angels and spirits and spoke to them and when he later uh, produced his engravings because this is his uh, occupation in life uh, not so much as a, a poet he did write poems but as rather as a uh, engraver he uh, uh, copied what he said he'd already seen <laughs> in these visions and he also spoke of his poems having been dictated to him along the same lines that Milton is said to have uh, presented to us, Paradise Lost. He says that he, uh, to quote Milton here, uh, they amused to, to whom, whom to him uh, dictated his, uh, I've, I've lost the context, the thread that allows me to get into the quotation, but unpremeditated uh, has, while he's slumbering, he has been given the lines for Paradise Lost, and then he recounted them to his daughter, who then wrote them down, Milton being blind at the time. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, so Blake was given to these visionary episodes, and he has very idiosyncratic views of the world, and I said to you last time that many of his contemporaries regarded Blake to be something of a madman. That's certainly uh, William Wordsworth's uh, impression. Uh, and he, uh, from but from Blake's point of view, it was the world that was mad, not he. And in accordance with that, he constructs a mythological universe of his own and includes thereby uh, his own private mythology, which I said to you in uh, class time, uh, the only likeness of which I can find as a, as a comparable um, imaginary uh, enterprise is that of W.B. Yeats, uh, the great Irish poet of the 20th century who likewise constructs his own private mythology. And this is one of the challenges of William Blake and one of the reasons that we're not going to get further into his literary corpus. Although, again, the main reason is that this is a course on Milton and the Romantics or the Romantic epic. And so not uh, meant to be an introduction to the Romantic poets. But when one is uh, encountering Blake, there is the additional challenge that he has this, as I say, his own idiosyncratic uh, terminology and even mythology. But from Blake's point of view, as I said, the world was mad, uh, filled with cruelty and anxiety and bloodshed, uh, a repressive form of morality and prone to a very self, selfish and self-absorbed and loveless uh, behavior. Uh, and, and later on in his uh, literary corpus, he would produce images um, of, or symbols or whatever you would have uh, them be called of society and presented the uh, even ancient civilization in the form of the Druids as being uh, priests who offered human sacrifice. This is a matter of, of, of fact, by the way. Uh, when we see in our modern neo-pagans uh, this desire for a return to 
Druidic practices, we have to recognize that the Druids themselves were not simply uh, some form of Buddhist pacifists, not that Buddhists are all pacifists, but that's the Western portrait. Um, but the, the Druids were actually practiced uh, human sacrifice and they believed it. And, and Blake believed that human sacrifice was the very basis of human organization. And with that in mind, um, and, and so he pre presents this in his poetry in various forms. So in the, in the Chimney Sweeper, um, in his Songs of Innocence and Experience, he's, uh, what he's doing is uh, prophetically, um, and, and to my mind rather successfully, critiquing the practice of using small children, often from poor families or even from orphanages, and then sending them down chimneys to deal with the problem of chimney fires. They have to sweep out the, the um, carbonization that comes from the fires and the children go down and do this. And for that reason, they shave their heads to keep the soot out of their hair, but they tend to die at a young age from the exposure to that in their lungs and so forth. Blake regarded this as a barbaric progress, uh, practice rather, uh, and decried it. Um, and he would have likewise decried the uh, abuse of the uh, African people in the uh, slave trade. And with that, he would have joined many of his contemporaries uh, in the, and most of them Christian, in decrying the slave trade. For Blake, these things were social ills and the primary cause of the ill, however, was a lack of imagination. Now in this, uh, this was uh, to some degree the direction in which we, we saw Wordsworth and Coleridge go in, in their uh, initial work, uh, literary work. They are more involved in the social uh, activists and more in a sort of a political uh, criticism. But in their more mature work, and in their more celebrated work, they retreat from that explicit social criticism into what is more of a poetic response to this. And they see these uh, grand social atrocities and political atrocities like that of Napoleon uh, and his op uh, oppressive regime and the uh, reign of terror in France as themselves failures of imagination that were simply uh, replacing the previous failures of imagination and the remedy for these failures of imagination was the proper use of the imagination. Now in this, Blake, I think, is clearer to some degree than Wordsworth is even. But all of them regard the imagination as a uh, liberating faculty and one that uh, uh, it offers many blessings to humanity. But the reason that it's a failure of imagination is it simply fails to, to even imagine what it's like to uh, for society, for the way in which we approach others, the way we understand nature, to be anything other than we have received it from our forebears. And therefore, they all have a similar sense of the need to get back to nature. So in, in Blake's conception, once again, he uses the landscapes that, we that would be familiar from uh, pastoral poetry uh, in his Songs of Innocence and Experience and the Innocent Songs in particular, the landscapes are rural. There are pastors, there are shepherds, there are children. What there are not in those landscapes are, are lovers. So we don't, it's not the poetry of, of the eclogues. It's not the poetry of traditional pastoral poetry where there's a, a shepherd and there's the shepherdess and there's a love union going on. The, the pastoral uh, landscape of romantic poetry is not interested in the usual love lyrics uh, that we will find characteristic of Song of Songs, which I just addressed in another class. Uh, they are more interested in nature as a uh, renewing um, source, uh, a quasi-divine uh, means of accessing um, uh, an imaginative vision, which they are trying to present as a uh, an antidote to all forms of oppressive morality, including Mr. Milton's, but we'll come to that. Uh, but for Blake, the primary failure there is simply a slavish acceptance of things as they are, a passivity. And his, his remedy is the, as I say, the imagination in its uh, most active forms. And with that, let's come to the marriage of heaven and hell. The marriage of heaven and hell. 
Uh, the Marriage of Heaven and Hell is obviously dealing with one of the themes of Milton's Paradise Lost, insofar as uh, Milton's Paradise Lost deals with the uh, uh, original sin and with the clash, as it were, between uh, two forces, the that of God, who's represented uh, in book three uh, of, of Paradise Lost, and, and the devil, uh, who's place, if you will, is uh, recounted in books one and two of Paradise Lost. Uh, and there in Milton's depiction, they're presented as um, uh, categorically distinct. The, the devil and hell are as far away from God as could possibly be. Milton is, is uh, trying to capture the biblical sense that evil uh, is the uh, privation of good. And I, I've uh, lectured upon this when talking about Milton's portrait of evil in Paradise Lost. If you want further subject, uh, further uh, information on that, you could have a look at uh, C.S. Lewis's writing on this uh, when he talks about uh, Milton's Augustinian portrait of evil. So once again, evil does not exist in and of itself, but rather is the privation of the good or the absence of the good. And so there's nothing too evil as such. It is simply uh, a parasite on the good. This is the orthodox portrait that Milton is presenting here. Blake does not present evil and good in those orthodox terms. He presents them more in terms of, um, I would say, uh, heretical dualistic form. And then with that, opposes that dualistic form as um quite frankly, erroneous, which of course it is. But, but Blake seems to associate the heretical stance on, uh, on good and evil, evil, namely that it's, there's this sort of dualism, Manichaean two forces, there's the good and there's the evil. And with that, um, he then says it's not quite so simple and this is not correct. Well, of course, he's correct that the Manichaean portrait uh, of good and evil is uh, heretical. He doesn't use the term, but is false. What Where he errs is in connecting the Manichaean view of evil with the Christian view of good and evil, this dualism, as if they were simply contraries of one another or opposite. So it's a misreading of Paradise Lost, first of all. Secondly, he then moves on to uh, see uh, Milton as a figure of the imagination like him, but one that is devoted to a false uh, conception of what that constitutes. And, and, and with that, a, a doctrinal one. And for Blake, all forms of fixity, doctrinal or, or otherwise, are inherently unimaginative. So he sees Milton as a great imaginative poet, but he fails in tethering that imaginative capacity to Christian orthodoxy. So as I say, first of all, misreading of what good and evil are in the Christian conception, he sees it in Manichaean forms and not in the forms of, of Boethius or Augustine, uh, whereby evil is the absence or the privation of good, as I said. And then secondly, he sees uh, Milton as because he holds to uh, the Christian view, which Blake associates with a Manichaean view, he is a limit, his imagination is limited and stunted. And thereby, Blake is in this work, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, trying to suggest that there is a more nuanced and sophisticated way of presenting the relation of good and evil. Now, this is a, a second bite at the cherry, another attempt at uh, trying to imagine, imaginatively conceive what he also did with the Songs of Innocence and Experience. There are two, they are two sides of more or less the same coin, neither in and of themselves good. And so there's a sort of a continuum, or a, as Blake presents it, a marriage. Now, as I said to you in our uh, discussion uh, leading up to this, C.S. Lewis, uh, in his work, The Great Divorce, is directly responding to Blake's The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. Uh, and if you want to have a look at what uh, Lewis wrote on that, I'll refer you to the uh, lecture I gave on that topic uh, last year uh, and not get into that here. 
But what is clear to my mind is that uh, Lewis was unhappy with the way in which uh, Blake was misunderstanding what, what love was and how it worked and how it worked in relation to God. And he, he confessed, Lewis de, did, that he didn't entirely understand what Blake was even trying to get at. And to be fair, it's very challenging to understand exactly what Blake is getting at here. But I've tried to give you some indications here. It starts with a misreading of what Christianity is saying, then leads to a misunderstanding of what Milton is doing. And what we get is a very idiosyncratic Blakean reading of these things. To add to the complexity, he's engaging with yet another author who is influential on him, uh, who figures in the marriage of heaven and hell. And this is, was a Swedish th theologian by the name of Emanuel uh, Swedenborg, um, who by this point had already uh, died. So he's uh, 1688 to 1772, uh, best known for his work on uh, the afterlife, uh, which was simply called Heaven and Hell. Um, I, I had to look up a bit on Swedenborg. I've looked at Swedenborg over the years, um, and it's uh, his his theology is entirely idiosyncratic. It is something akin to oneness Pentecostalism, insofar as uh, Jesus. The focus is on Jesus, but to the exclusion of the Trinity. For for Swedenborg, uh, the Trinity is a doctrine that emerged later. Uh, in in uh, Nicene, Nicene Christendom, but in the Apostles' Creed, we don't get any reference to the Trinity. So the argument goes, and this has been echoed by uh, later liberal theologians as well, that the Trinity is uh, is a is an invention of the Church. It's not in the Bible. Uh, my friend Tony Costa has just written a book on this topic, uh, uh, connecting uh, the. Uh, the creedal understandings of Christianity in in the corpus of the Bible itself, the beginnings of it, or the the seminal features of it, and I would agree with that. So the uh, Trinitarian conception is grounded in Scripture, uh, but Swedenborg echoed the liberal theologians, in, or maybe anticipated them even in asserting that uh, there is no such basis in Scripture. And so he talks about the person of Jesus, who is divine in Swedenborg's understanding. Uh, but just like the so-called oneness Pentecostals gets rid of the Trinity in this. And Blake is moving in this direction uh, in his own work. Uh, for Blake, the word, however, he departs even from that view uh, in seeing Jesus more as a, a figure and expression of the imagination. Um, not that he's disputing his uh, existence or his deity, uh, I don't think, but more seeing uh, him as a principle of, of creativity in general, and thereby seeing the Bible also as uh, the great code of Western art. And that's the Blake's famous uh, word uh, description, rather, uh, which Northrop Fry then makes the, uh, the title of his own work on the Bible as literature. So my I'm currently teaching on the Bible as literature in another class, and it ha just happens to overlap with what I'm doing here, which is always helpful and interesting. But that's uh, Fry's take on it, the literary way and the way in which the Bible, as, as, uh, as uh, Blake says, and also uh, Northrop Fry, and to some degree, even Jordan Peterson is seeing as the great code of uh, not just Western art, but Western thinking. And I think while there's some truth in that, it, it's also uh, misinterpreting and misunderstanding the, the true power that we can see in the words of God and scripture. But I won't get down that rabbit hole right now. Um, to the marriage of heaven and hell then, uh, written between 1790 and, and 1793, so fairly lengthy period of composition when uh, Blake, if you or if you take the chronology that I, g I just gave you, uh, is somewhere between 33 and 36. Uh, it is satirical. Uh, it needs to be seen uh, as satire. It is ridiculing this figure that I just represented uh, or mentioned, Emanuel Swedenborg, um, a man that Blake once respected, but eventually came to uh, reject and repudiate. Uh, and 
he uh but the main focus of attack is not on swedenborg that's just sort of there uh, occasionally the real focus of attack is on sexual and social morality backed by religion uh and uh and the legal establishment and the political establishment for that matter which for him uh is iniquitous because it restrains uh a person's energy and passion and genius uh and and thereby it condemns us to a sort of a spectral existence uh, of the sort that, again, Lewis, if you've read uh, The Great Divorce, the way Lewis presents uh, heaven uh, to the um, people who have not yet understood the great glory of God is that they see it as a spectral place where there isn't a real life, but actually the things that are most real are the most solid and substantial. But again, uh, Lewis is, is doing a very careful and, to my mind, uh, brilliant reading and engagement with Blake's work. So the one's almost a, a, a necessary correlate to the other. Um, but the attack, but he he uses stock associations in order to satirize and, and ridicule. Uh, when he refers to a marriage, one final comment, um, it's not a marriage per se, it's rather a dynamic confrontation of contraries. Uh, so to use one of the Proverbs of hell, hell, without contraries, there's no progression, he says. And so what we get is something along the lines of a he Hegelian thesis, antithesis, and then a synthesis. And then that basis for the synthesis becomes the ground for the next thesis, which uh, to which an antithesis gets set up, and then a synthesis. So a sort of a progressive foundation for progressive progressive imagination progressive thought in in that sense um, so let me begin by reading some extracts from it and then I will commentate on commentate on it uh, and uh, we'll see if we can make something um, comprehensible of this uh, quite frankly uh, evocative but challenging work and this is from the argument now the argument here, uh, uh, Rintraw, to which it refers at the outset, is, is in in Blake's work works is the uh, name for the angry prophet, uh, John the Baptist type, maybe Isaiah, maybe who knows, but a voice crying out in the wilderness. So Rintraw is the pro prophetic uh, word, name for a prophetic figure, and Blake probably is that prophetic figure. So the argument taken from Milton's Paradise Lost, the argument. Rintraw roars and shakes his fires in the burdened air. Hungry clouds swag on the deep. Once meek and in a perilous path, the just man keep, kept his course along the vale of death. Roses are planted where thorns grow, and on the barren heath sing the honeybees. Then the perilous path was planted, and a river and a spring on every cliff and tomb, and on the bleached bones red clay brought forth till the villain left the paths of ease to walk in perilous paths and drive the just man into barren climes. Now the sneaking serpent walks in mild humility and the just man rages in the wilds where lions roam. Rintra roars and shakes his fires in the burdened air, hungry clouds swag on the deep. So the uh, argument concludes with the same two lines that it with which it begins. And what he presents here in the argument in a very brief form, 20 lines, is an account of the fall uh, in Paradise Lost. Uh, references to the red clay uh, in, in Hebrew, uh, Adam means red clay. Uh, and we have something along the line. So, by the way, in, in Swedenborg's conception, the last judgment began in 1757, the year of Blake's birth. Uh, and Blake writing 33 years later um, is uh, at the same age that the church historically saw Christ uh, being crucified, the age of 33. Uh, and so what we have here is the portrait of the eternal hell is uh, simultaneously... Uh, the new heaven. So there's a new heaven and a new earth. So a little potted account in Genesis or in Genesis in the argument here, uh, verses one to 20 
uh, of a of a sort of a fall place where there are uh, there's death, the red clay coming out of the of the bleached bones, and then the villain leaving the paths of ease. And the villain, by the way, the devil is uh, an imaginative figure. You must uh, the satire the satire involves us seeing the, the the apparently good conventional figures as figures of repression, and the evil characters, at least the stock associations, being actually the emancipatory, uh, imaginative characters like Mr. Blake himself. I'll carry on. As a new heaven is begun, and it is now 33 years since its advent, the eternal hell revives. And lo, Swedenborg is the angel sitting at the tomb. His writings are the linen clothes folded up. Now is the dominion of Edom, and the return of Adam unto paradise. See Isaiah 34 and 35. Without contraries is no progression. Attraction and repulsion, reason and energy, love and hate are necessary to human existence. From these contraries spring what the religious call good and evil. Good is the passive that obeys reason. Evil is the active springing from energy. Good is heaven. Evil is hell. Now, that's, the, that's exactly what he's going to uh, dispute here and satirize. Now, the voice of the devil. All Bibles or sacred codes have been the causes of the following errors. That man has two real existing principles, viz. a body and a soul. Two, that energy, called evil, is alone from the body, and that reason, called good, is alone from the soul. This is Gnostic dualism, by the way, and it has nothing to do with the Bible. But again, Blake, uh, his reading of Christian orthodoxy is just appalling, <laughs> quite frankly. He doesn't understand what he's talking about, and he conflates uh, things that are actually opposed to one another, nonetheless. Three, that God will torment man in eternity for following his energies. But the following contraries to these are true. Man has no body distinct from his soul, for that called body is a portion of soul discerned by the five senses, the chief inlets of soul in this age. Two, energy is the only life and is from the body, and reason is the bound or outward circumference of energy. Three, energy is eternal delight. Now, what Blake appears to be uh, critiquing as the error of all Bibles or sacred codes is nothing other than Gnostic dualism and misapprehensions of the relation of the body to the soul in Christian theology. So he presents as the idea that the body is evil and that the soul is good as Christian theology, when in fact um, there's nothing uh, remotely true about this position. This is exactly what, uh, this is a heretical position, and there are varieties of takes on this, which you could denounce as heretical positions and name them as such. Um, and I won't get into all of them here because there's, it's, uh, as I say, I don't have sufficient time to get into tracing all the errors. But the idea that there is no, that the truth is that man has no body distinct from his soul is simply fallacious. So the truth that he presents is also an error. There is a distinction between body and soul. Nonetheless, it's impossible to conceive of a person uh, uh, with uh, of a body without a soul or a soul without a body. There's no disembodied souls. Um, and the proof of the goodness of the human body is in the person of Jesus Christ himself, who is God and man. When he And he's crucified bodily and he's also raised bodily. Uh, these demonstrate the importance of the body to Orthodox Christian theology. But likewise, uh, this is not to say that a soul and a body are indistinct. Um, otherwise, we would not be able to refer to them as such, and we would it would be impossible for us to even think about our bodies uh, as if we could stand uh, at a distance from them and apart from them and to consider them and the consequences of what we do with our bodies. These are... Um, apprehended and understood from what we call the soul. Uh, um, still, 
Uh, and so then when he goes in the direction of seeing this, uh, energy is the only life and it's from the body. He's, he's grasped, he's trying to grasp something uh, that is uh, um, in, the, in the general tendency to di dis dislike the bo human body, which he could, you could attribute this to Cartesian philosophy as much as anything, which uh, is probably a recapitulation of a sort of a Gnosticism. The idea that the cogito, the thinking uh, thing or the thinking substance, the res cogitans, to use Descartes' uh, Latin phrase, uh, is inside the body, is, uh, as some say, a sort of a understanding of human nature, whereby the, the human nature is presented as a ghost in a machine. Uh, he may be critiquing exactly that view, but that's not the Christian view. It's the Cartesian view. It's, it's a Gnostic view. Uh, it's a revival of that, nonetheless. Uh, Blake is trying to break down the false boundaries there of Cartesian philosophy and Gnosticism, and as such, he deserves to be lauded, and people have lauded him for that. But there's uh, where I would critique him is in his conflation of this understanding with a biblical understanding. That's simply flat wrong. Uh, but let me go on. Uh, those who restrain desire do so because theirs is weak enough to be restrained. And the restrainer or reason usurps its place and governs the unwilling. Now note the portrait of reason here as well, and this is very interesting and not uncommon for the romantics either, is to see the reason as effectively a passive faculty, which needs the activity of the imagination to become truly um, liberated and to be truly human. So reason will follow the imagination. We'll find, although I'm not going to read it on this, this particular course because it exceeds the boundaries of uh, the course as I've appointed them here in the uh, defense of poesy or poetry by Percy Shelley. He opposes the reason and the imagination and he presents the reason as a passive faculty whereby the imagination is a very active faculty, the poetic faculty. Um, so this portrait of reasoning seems to me a critique of the associative reasoning of the 18th century uh, and uh, its misunderstandings of what reason actually does. But um, I won't get further into that here. I did briefly touch on that when we spoke of the Biographia Literaria. <clears throat> but see, so when he talks about restraining desire and being passive, he says he gives a, a psychological rationale for that. It's because their desires are weak enough to be restrained. And being restrained, he, he further writes, it by degrees becomes passive till it is only the shadow of desire. The history of this is written in Paradise Lost, says, says Blake. And the governor or reason is called Messiah. Now, this is a very idiosyncratic reading of Paradise Lost. Indeed, it's a spiritual reading, an allegorical reading, if you will. And the ar original archangel or possessor of the command of the heavenly host is called the devil or Satan, and his children are called sin and death. But in the book of Job, Milton's Messiah is called Satan. For this history has been adopted by both parties. It indeed appeared to reason as if desire was cast out. But the devil's account is that the Messiah fell and formed a heaven of what he stole from the abyss. This is shown in the gospel. John 16, verse 7, not entirely clear what he's referring to, because again, this is a, uh, a Blakean reading of uh, these texts, where Jesus prays to the Father to send the Comforter, or desire, that reason may have ideas to build on, the Jehovah of the Bible being no other than he who dwells in flaming fire. Know that after Christ's death, he became Jehovah. But in Milton, the father is destiny, the son, a ratio of the five senses, a ratio, and the Holy Ghost, vacuum. Note, and this is a famous note, the reason Milton wrote in fetters when he wrote of angels and God, and at liberty when of devils in hell, is because he was a true poet and of the devil's party without knowing it. So this idiosyncratic reading of Milton that Blake presents here, uh, which uh, 
uh, Blake uh, adopting the sort of romantic hermeneutics, uh, which Schleiermacher mean, makes famous, namely that we can know as well, if not better than the original authors about their work, because we stand at a distance and know better and see the consequences of their work. So Blake is claiming to some degree an authority over what Milton meant when he wrote this. And, yeah, and yet here are Milton's blind spots because Blake can see them clearly. Um, so he, uh, among other things, uh, Christ becomes Jehovah and, of course, uh, the Holy Ghost becomes a vacuum, etc., all this stuff. This is, again, bleeding into the sort of oneness Pentecostalism, whereby uh, what we have are variations on um, uh, a modalistic monarchianism if you want to look all that up, but modalistic monarchianism is a, a so-called Christian theology that upholds the oneness of God and the deity of Christ. And uh, it considers God to be one of those working through different modes. And said, but modalism, of course, is, is a heretic, heretical uh, position within Christianity and nothing like, like orthodox. It is a sort of imaginative rendering but again, it departs, to my mind, from the text when it does so, by which I mean the Bible. And so, um, uh, but it's interesting that Blake's critique of Milton here, his engagement with it, uh, is to some degree critiquing the Trinitarian orthodoxy of Milton's portrait in Paradise Lost. So in that penultimate section that I just read, in Milton, the father is destiny, the son a, a ratio of the five senses and the Holy Ghost a vacuum. Um, there is something of an anticipation of the uh, uh, of a critique of Milton's Trinitarian theology there. And I'm not sure this is the way Blake presents it is anything other than Blakean, but there is some uh, warrant, I think, for questioning how robust the Trinity uh, is presented in Milton's portrait in Paradise Lost. But the final comment uh, is that uh, Milton's poetic genius seemed to soar when describing the devil and the fallen angels, that is in the first two books of Paradise Lost, and then relatively speaking, limped when he portrayed God and the angels is because, of course, he was less confined by orthodoxy. That's Blake's explanation. Orthodoxy is a constraining force, a repressive force, uh, one that constrains the imagination, including Mr. Milton's. And so therefore, uh, as a poet, he was of the devil's party, but without knowing it. And the without knowing it is, I think, crucial. He's not saying that Milton was an apologist for the devil. He's saying that Milton, just like he, is going to present the evil figure uh, as a liberating figure because it represents the imagination. And that's Blake's take on it. So let me carry on here and we'll get to the Proverbs of Hell uh, and um, I'll pick up some of the features and I'm going to skip a lot of the memorable fan fancies largely, but we'll, we'll uh, get to the Proverbs of Hell. But let me read one of the memorable fancies. Now, the memorable fancies are interspersed throughout the entirety of the marriage of heaven and hell. Uh, and they account for the sort of the narrative portions of the, uh, the text. But uh, let, me, let me read the first one at any rate. As I was walking among the fires of hell, delighted with the enjoyments of genius, which to angels look like torment and insanity, I collected some of their proverbs, thinking that as the sayings used in a nation mark its character, so the proverbs of hell show the nature of infernal wisdom better than any description of buildings or garments. When I came home on the abyss of the five senses, where a flat-sided steep frowns over the present world, I saw a mighty devil folded in black clouds, hovering on the sides of the rock. With corroding fires, he wrote the following sentence, now perceived by the minds of men and read by them on earth. How do you know but every bird that cuts the airy way is an immense world of delights, closed by your senses? Five. Um, so the memorable fancy that he presents here, um, the title, by the way, is a parody of Swedenborg's um, 
uh, memorable relations in which he describes visions of the spiritual world. So he presents these memorable fancies, um, uh, as I say, satirizing Swedenborg's own portrait. So again, for those of, uh, this is why Blake was and remains an idiosyncratic writer. He's referring to, to other idiosyncratic writers alongside those that are better known and better regarded, namely Mr. Milton. Uh, but uh, he, uh, again, talks about the glory of, of the created order. And this is where people find the most delight in Blake, I think, is in the, wonder, the wondrous conception he has of the glory of the created uh, things in the same way that we see in, uh, in Job, where God speaks of the things that he has created and their beasts uh, and the marvel of the beasts, uh, which we simply cannot grasp. How could the man who, who, or how could a God who created the Leviathan also create uh, a bird? Or in Blake's conception, how can the, how can the God who created a lamb also create the tiger, the tiger, tiger burning bright in the forest of the night? Uh, what a mortal hand or I dare frame thy fearful symmetry. Um, and so come the proverbs of hell. And now proverbs, just a little, proverbs are pithy sayings, aphorisms, in this case they are um, exactly that. Blake doesn't present it in Hebraic form. They're not in the form of uh, dualisms or, or, or not dualisms, but um, in, in two parts. Um, he simply juxtaposes contrary ideas. Um, and yet what he's getting at is to try and shake up and break up the stock associations with certain conventional figures. And I think in that, some of these proverbs are uh, extraordinarily powerful. So I'll, I'll read several, many of them, in fact. In seed time, learn. In harvest, teach. In winter, enjoy. Drive your cart and your plow over the bones of the dead. The road of excess leads to the palace of wisdom. Prudence is a rich, ugly, old maid courted by incapacity. He who desires but acts not breeds pestilence. The cut worm forgives the plow. Dip him in the river who loves water. A fool sees not the same tree that a wise man sees. He whose face gives no light shall never become a star. Eternity is in love with the productions of time. The busy bee has no time for sorrow. The hours of folly are measured by the clock, but of wisdom no clock can measure. All wholesome food is caught without a net or a trap. Bring out number, weight, and measure in a year of dearth. No bird soars too high if he soars with his own wings. A dead body revenges, not injuries. The most sublime act is to set another before you. If the fool would persist in his folly, he would become wise. Folly is the cloak of knavery. Shame is pride's cloak. Prisons are built with stones of law, brothels with bricks of religion. In both cases, uh, those last two, fall or three, folly, the cloak of knavery, shame, pride's cloak, and prisons as the stones of the law and brothels with the bricks of religion. He is talking about the uh, seemingly symbiotic relationship, particularly in a Pharisaic understanding of these things. So what Blake is portraying as religious views are in fact Pharisaic understandings of, of religion uh, and man-centered views of religion and, and, and a failure to understand the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus and what the uh, faith in Jesus Christ actually entails, which is not in uh, in being a law uh, abider per se, as if by obeying the law, we could be pleasing to God in and of itself. 
but look look at these he he builds on the same sort of thing the pride of the peacock is the glory of god the lust of the goat is the bounty of god the wrath of the lion is the wisdom of god the nakedness of woman is the work of god so the listing of a variety of things one after the other and talking about the glory of god and all these things and, th and this is where blake is at his best i think in uh talking about the majesty and glory of god and seeing it in such diverse things and none of them uh ipso facto evil in and of themselves uh excess of sorrow laughs excess of joy weeps the roaring of lions, the howling of wolves, the raging of the stormy sea, and the destructive sword are portions of eternity too great for the eye of man. The fox condemns the trap, not himself. Joys impregnate, sorrows bring forth. Let man wear the fell of the lion, woman the fleece of the sheep. The bird a nest, the spider a web, man friendship the selfish smiling fool and the sullen frowning fool shall be both thought wise that they may be a rod what is now proved was once only imagined the rat the mouse the fox the rabbit watch the roots the lion the tiger the horse the elephant watch the fruits the little rhyme there note that the beasts portrayed are looking in different places uh, the creatures that i would say are less uh, noble are looking down the more noble are looking up to the fruits uh, wherein shall we look we shall raise our eyes and look up the cistern contains the fountain overflows again all these different images suggesting the uh the unbounded uh life-giving principles of energy all of them trying to suggest these in different ways now these are proverbs of hell wise sayings one thought fills immensity always be ready to speak your mind and a base man will avoid you everything possible to be believed is an image of truth the eagle never lost so much time as when he submitted to learn of the crow. The fox provides for himself, but God provides for the lion. Think in the morning, act in the noon, eat in the evening, sleep in the night. He who has suffered you to impose on him knows you. As the plow follows words, so God rewards prayers. The tigers of wrath are wiser than the horses of instruction. Expect poison from the standing water. You never know what is enough unless you know what is more than enough. Listen to the fool's reproach. It is a, a kingly title. Uh, I'll yeah, I'll read the entirety of them. Uh, and then I'll conclude with this. Just quite good, I think. Uh, the eyes of fire, the nostrils of air, the mouth of water, the beard of earth. The weak in courage is strong in cunning. The apple tree never asks the beech how he shall grow, nor the lion, the horse, how he shall take his prey. The thankful receiver bears a plentiful harvest. If others had not been foolish, we should be so. The soul of sweet delight can never be defiled. When thou, thou seest an eagle, thou seest a portion of genius. Lift up thy head. As the caterpillar chooses the fairest leaves to lay her eggs on, so the priest lays his curse on the fairest joys. To create a little flower in the labor of ages, damn braces, bless 
relaxes. Sounds Burkean. The best wine is the oldest. The best water, the newest. Prayers plow not. Praises reap not. Joys laugh not. Sorrows weep not. The head sublime, the heart pathos, the genitals beauty, the hands and feet proportion. As the air to a bird or the sea to a fish, so is contempt to the contemptible. The crow, the crow, the crow, the crow wished everything was black and the owl that everything was white. Exuberance is beauty. If the lion was advised by the fox, he would be cunning. Improvement makes straight roads, but the crooked roads without improvement are roads of genius. Sooner murder an infant in its cradle than nurse unenacted, unacted desires. Where man is not, nature is barren. Truth can never be told so as to be un understood and not be believed. Enough or too much? And then finally, his commentary on his Proverbs of Hell here. The ancient poets animated all sensible objects with gods or geniuses, calling them by the names and adorning them with the properties of woods, rivers, mountains, lakes, cities, nations, and whatever their enlarged and numerous senses could perceive. And particularly, they studied the genius of, every, of each city and country, placing it under its mental deity, till a system was formed which some took advantage of and enslaved the vulgar by attempting to realize or abstract the mental deities from their objects. Thus began priesthood, choosing forms of worship from poetic tales. And at length, they pronounced that the gods had ordered such things. Thus men forgot that all deities reside in the human breast. Okay, so I'm going to leave it off with that, and I'm going to make a few comments here about those Proverbs of Hell and the uh, general gist of uh, the, the uh, marriage of heaven and hell here. And what's striking to me uh, in general, and it's, it's uh, helpful to read over the entirety of the Proverbs uh, because they're so miscellaneous in some ways, but what, uh, one of the impressions that arises out of it is that the notion of equality is being uh, undermined, that there's a, an equivalence where everything is effectively an emanation with its, without any real differentiation from other things. Blake is clearly seeing uh, that there are, um, that the particularity of the world uh, has a glory about it, and he's defending that and suggesting that um, things are good to be different. And this goes very much against the Age of Enlightenment in which he is operating and in which we continue to operate. And uh, noting that uh, there is not a one uh, way of conceiving things, uh, which I would say a Kantian uh, view of, uh, of reasoning uh, tends towards, where there is one law uh, to which all things must conform, and that is what we call reasoning. And this this um, this thrust and push pressure towards a universalizing reason, Blake is strongly opposed to that. And he will move on to suggest that Milton, and we'll see this in a second when he comes to Blake's Milton, he will present this this God under the title of uh, the name Urizen, uh, which sounds a lot like uh, the Greek horizon or horizon, or the in this case, the limitations are the boundary of a landscape. Um, uh, Blake associates Milton with a, a sort of an enlightenment understanding of reasoning there, whereas his is acknowledging the, the particularity of the created order and the goodness in that particularity, and that to uh, try and um, come up with a, a system that categorizes things um, in a, a legalistic fashion in the Kantian form is effectively to be um, uh, blasphemous. Now, Blake is associating this with 
uh, with Milton, with all Bibles or sacred codes, but it seems to me more, more of a critique of the Enlightenment than it is uh, of the uh, uh, of Milton, who seems to, uh, at least to my mind, to be granting the glory of and goodness of the created order as God has ordained it, and the separation of such things. Um, and, but the way in which uh, Blake illustrates this is is nothing other than brilliant. I think his proverbs, while not proverbial in the sense that they're repeated by others, uh, have a wisdom about them and a beauty in their presentation, which I think retains its power even hundreds of years after the fact. Um, so even these uh, antinomies here, like um, uh, what was it, the wine, the uh, oldest wine is the best and the newest water is the best two forms of fluids and yet uh, in each case a very different experience depending on the age uh, of the uh, wine and or water uh, he presents that all over the place in terms of these contraries but there's goodness in the two states of contrariety and he wants to affirm that not simply to say one is good and the other is evil but rather each has its good we will affirm that with mr blake and agree that he's correct. Where I will differ from him is in his association of that understanding of good and evil as being anything other than Manichaeanism, which is nothing like Christianity. It's a misrepresentation of Christianity. Uh, all the same. We will, we will uh, move on here. And I wanted to look at that uh, briefly, and I think it's brilliant. I do think it's brilliant. I also think it's a misapprehension of Christian orthodoxy and a conflation of it with something that it actually opposes. All the same. Uh, influential, important, and, uh, and worth reading to this day. Uh, let me move on now to his work, Milton, which is a poem in two books, uh, and the subtitle here of his poem Milton is a poem in two books to justify the ways of God to man, direct quotation from Milton's invocation in book one of Paradise Lost. Um, to assert eternal providence, Milton says, is the purpose of writing this book and to justify the ways of God to man. Uh, here it's just to justify the ways of God to man in Milton, or rather in Blake's rendition. Now this is composed in and around the same time, uh, this work called Milton. Um, and then with, but it's the shortest of all of his major prophetic works. And there are a variety here uh, that we're simply not going to address, but we're, Milton, it's called Milton. So this, we're looking at it on the course for that reason alone. Uh, Milton is uh, in Blake's imagination and in his opinion, the supreme uh, poet. And so for all of his critique of Milton, uh, he admires him like no other poet. Um, and I said that Coleridge does the same, and I think that even Milton does, or Milton Wordsworth does. And in fact, indeed, I think that they all do. All the Romantic poets are, uh, are attracted to Milton, and probably because of the way in which Coleridge describes Milton's particular genius to reside, namely that he takes all poetic forms and all idea ideas and they clothes them, cl he clothes them in his own uh, character and imaginative form, the forms he gathers to him, whereas Shakespeare is the opposite, according to Coleridge, and I think this is a helpful description. We don't know what Shakespeare thought about anything. We don't know what his religious views are. We don't know what his views of the monarchy were. We don't know what his uh, so political allegiances were. We don't know about his personal life, per se. Very little detail, considering how great a poet he is. But we, we value his poetry uh, and his, his drama, for that matter, because the characters on his pages leap to life in a way that is entirely uh, plausible and believable. And he has the capacity for what Keats calls negative capability, which is to negate his own personality there. And in that, uh, he is great, but it's not characteristic of the Romantics to gravitate towards Shakespeare, although they, they regard him as one of the two great poetic figures. Uh, it's to gravitate towards Milton. And I've already given reasons why that is. But it is uh, because of his, I would say, his moral uh, standing as a poet. Uh, 
and they're they're similar than uh, desire for moral authority in their works in defending the imagination against the enlightenment reasoning. That's how they see themselves. And that's how I think we should see it here. So Blake, for Blake, Milton is a supreme poet, but he has unfortunately and unaccountably to, ma to, to Blake's understanding, uh, bowed down and worshiped a false god whom Blake calls Urizen. And he, and, and he, uh, this false god Urizen is there to constrain human energy and imagination. And that's how he depicts uh, Milton's portrait of the God the Father uh, and of the Son in Paradise Lost. So it's a, it's a limited and it's a lar an entirely too orthodox conception of there. And as a result, it has uh, affected his own being. And Blake is going to be liberated from that by not worshiping that, to his mind, false god. And then, but if Milton were to become his true self, then he would have cast off these errors and not worshipped this particularized form of uh, the imagination, namely the Christian understanding of God, but rather of pure energy, as Blake conceives it. So this, what this means is. Uh, um, I, I, if we were doing a class on Milton or rather on Blake, we would expand on that here. I don't want to do that for the lack of time here. What I do want to do is give you an introduction to this uh, poem, uh, namely the preface. And the preface will contain uh, a hymn, uh, not a hymn in Blake's time, but what becomes a hymn, and it's called Jerusalem. It's a, it's a hymn that's sung, and it's almost an unofficial anthem in uh, in England, sung at uh, rugby matches, among other things, uh, presented in the famous uh, film 1980, thereabouts, Chariots of Fire as well, towards the end of it, um, often at, at uh, weddings as well. Um, and not many people know that it comes from this work dedicated to Milton, uh, because it's an extraordinary association at that point. But it's from the preface, and let me read the preface, and we'll give you the context, and then I'll conclude with the, uh, the hymn itself. The preface says, The stolen and perverted writings of Homer and Ovid, of Plato and Cicero, which all men ought to contemn, are set up by artifice against the sublime of the Bible. But when the new age is at leisure to pronounce all will be set right. And those grand works of the more ancient and consciously and professedly inspired men will hold their proper rank. And the daughters of memory, the muses, shall become the daughters of inspiration. Shakespeare and Milton were both curbed by the general malady and infection from the silly Greek and Latin slaves of the sword. So that, this is a Christian critique, as it were, of the classical heritage and inheritance, which he regarded Milton and Shakespeare to be laboring under still. They had not sufficiently Christianized it. Otherwise, their imaginations would have thrown off those shackles, as Blake does. We don't see the class classicism in Blake's writing. Rouse up, O young men of the new age. Set your foreheads against the ignorant hirelings. For we have hirelings in the camp and the court and the university who would, if they could, forever depress mental and prolong corpor corporeal war. Painters, on you I call. Sculptors, architects, suffer not the fashionable fools to depress your powers by the prices they pretend to give for contemptible works or the expensive advertising boasts that they make of such works. Believe Christ and his apostles that there is a class of men whose whole delight is in destroying. We do not want either Greek or Roman models if we are but just and true to our own imaginations, whose worlds of eternity in which we shall live forever in Jesus our Lord. So again, the great question of the ancient uh, church um, the challenge, what is Athens to do with Jerusalem? For Blake, nothing. 
the Greco-Roman conceptions are the, are to be uh, uh, context to be set aside uh, in favor of an imaginative way rendering of life, which Blake calls Christian, and contradistinguishes from everything that preceded him, including Mr. Milton. So here he tries to revive, uh, rehabilitate Milton. Uh, in his own work, but that is the context for what is the great uh, poem became, become him slash anthem, which I will now play for you and we will listen to it in which the words of this uh, poem are presented. And we'll see if we can get it to work. Would to God that all the Lord's people were prophets, he quotes then, Numbers 11, verse 29. Just a brief comment. The uh, context here, it's, I think, the understanding of this, this um, poem from the preface, uh, captured in the hymn, Jerusalem, is taken to reflect upon the, uh, maybe I'm wrong, the Industrial Revolution to uh, present the greenness of England, uh, the Lake District, um, in a sort of um, primal innocence. This the greenness as opposed to the depravity of the city and so forth, and the dark satanic mills referring to the Industrial Revolution, etc. The poem is written before the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the dark satanic mills are not a reference to uh, anything like the factories of, of England. The dark satanic mills are a reference to the things that he, to which he's just referred to at the outset here. He's referred to the hirelings in the camp, uh, the court and the university who will forever depress mental and prolonged corporeal war. And so he calls upon the artists to oppose that and create a greenness in the land. Now the greenness is as metaphorical as the darkness is associated with these mills. It's a mental fight. And in this poem, which is sung now as an anthem, he's calling upon a sort of a revolution in creative thinking. 
Uh, and that needs to be seen here. And of course, it's a very different reflection of, of poetic material than Milton pronounces in his Paradise Lost and his epic. But it is Blake's understanding of what constitutes epic subject matter to laud this as his goal. And it celebrated it once again in this famous poem, which is now a hymn and nigh on an anthem in England. And I just wanted to address that very briefly as we conclude this episode. And I'll see you next time.